So this video will go over sections three, four, and five, you know, some parts of four and five um, of chapter 10, um, nuclear um, uh, chemistry. So section three goes over half-life. So let's go through general features. The half-life, so T uh, of half-life, of a radioactive isotope is the time it takes for one half of the sample to decay. Because radioactivity um, has a life. And so we can measure its half-life. And for example, uh, phosphorus 32 uh, decays into sulfur 32 uh, by a beta emission. And we know that the half-life of phosphorus is um, um, 14 days. So after 14 days, if we had 16 grams of phosphorus 32, we know that after 14 days, we will have only half of the 16 grams. So from 16 grams, it goes down to eight grams of phosphorus 32. And half of it, so eight grams, has, has been uh, changed into sulfur 32. And then we uh, wait for another 14 days. And after another 14 days, the eight grams of phosphorus 32 have been decayed. Uh, half of it have been decayed to four grams of uh, sulfur 32. So now we have eight plus four, 12 grams of sulfur 32, and only four grams of phosphorus 32 left. Add another 14 days and half of the four grams have decayed. So we have now two grams of phosphorus 32 left and two grams plus the 12, that's 14 grams of sulfur uh, 32 now. So over the course of three half lives, we can see how phosphorus 32 has decayed, um, you know, from 16 grams to two grams. And so uh, the half-life of a radioactive isotope is a property of a given isotope. So every isotope has a different half-life and it can be very long or very short. And what is good is that this half-life is independent of the amount of the sample. It doesn't matter how much you start with half exactly, uh, will decay uh, over the time that is given for a half-life of an isotope. And so it's independent of the amount of sample, independent of the temperature and the pressure. For example, uh, these are the half-lives of some common radioisotopes. So carbon-14, which is used for archaeological dating, has a half-life of 5,730 years, so quite long, right? Uh, Cobalt-60, uh, used uh, in cancer therapy, has a half-life of 5.3 years. So um, iodine-131, uh, used in uh, thyroid therapy or cancer therapy, uh, you know, thyroid um, cancer, uh, has a half-life of eight days. Uh, potassium-40, uh, used in geological dating, has a half-life of 1.3, 10 to the nine years, so much longer than, than carbon-14, so it can help date uh, older things. Uh, phosphorus 32 has uh, been used in leukemia treatment, uh, has a half-life of 14.3 days, as we saw in the example. Uh, technetium 99 metastable has a half-life of six hours. This is pretty short, uh, and it's used for organ imaging. You see how the use uh, differs a lot depending on the, the half-life. Uh, for imaging, you want short half-lives. Uh, uranium-235, uh, which is used in nuclear reactor to um, generate energy in nuclear plants, power plants, has a half-life of seven, 10 to the eight years. So these are examples, and it shows how the half-life can vary a lot from an isotope to another. So how can we use the half-life to determine the amount of radioisotope present? So let's look at an example for that. 
if the half-life of iodine-131 is eight days, how much of a 100 milligram sample remains after 32 days? So iodine is used for um, hyperthyroidism or you know, thyroid cancers. So um, the first step is to determine how many half-lives occur in the given amount of time. So here we want to know how many um, iodine-131 are left over after 32 days. So you want to take the 32 days as your given amount, and you want to find out how many half-lives that corresponds to. And we know a half-life is eight days. So you can use um, one half-life equals eight days as an equality and as a conversion factor. So because here we have 32 days as the given amount, we want the eight days in the denominator and then the one half-life on the numerator. So 32 divided by eight, that means you have four half-lives in 32 days. Uh, next, you want uh, for each half-life to multiply the initial amount by one half to obtain the final mass, right? You want basically to divide the mass by half as many times as you have half-lives. So the 100 milligram sample, initial sample here, will be divided one time by half, two times by half, three times, and four times, because we had four half-lives. So that's why we multiply by one over two, uh, four times. And it comes down to, you know, multiplying 100 milligrams by one half uh, to the power of four. And two to the power of four um, is um, 16. So it's like 100 milligrams multiplied by one over 16. And that is 6.25 milligrams. And so that's the final mass. It's basically 100 grams divided by two, so 50 grams, milligrams, after a one half life. Then 50 milligrams divided by two, it's 25 milligrams after two half lives. 25 milligrams divided by two is 12 and a half milligrams after three half lives. And then 12 and a half divided by two is 6.25 milligrams left after four half lives. So that's the answer there for the final mass after 32 days. And that's the mass of iodine 131. So that was um, the example. Uh, here it shows how you can rewrite one over two to the power of four is also equal to the fraction 116, and 116 is equal to the fraction 6.25 divided by 100. So that's why the final mass is 6.25 milligrams. So um, another example here, and this time you need to try um, solving this problem by yourself. So you want to pause the video to try this before you watch the uh, solution, right? to make sure you are able to do it. So the half-life of technetium 99M, you know, 99 metastable, is six hours. If 100 milli, sorry, 185 milligrams uh, of sample of technetium 99M is used for diagnostic procedure, so imaging, how much of technetium 99 metastable remains after two days? So this is used for organ imaging. So typically you want it to be gone quickly. Um, so it has a short half-life of six hours. So we want to know how many half-lives you have during two days. So you start with two days. Uh, because we have a half-life in hours, you want to change the two days into hours. So first you will change days into uh, one day into 24 hours. So two days multiplied by 24 hours per day. We see how days cancel and now we have uh, 48 hours at that point. And so we want to um, multiply 48 hours by one half life and divide it by six hours per half life. So 48 divided by six, it's eight uh, half and half lives. So we have 
In two days, we have eight half-lives that have occurred for um, technetium 99M. So now for each of these half-lives, uh, we multiply the initial mass by one half to obtain the final mass. And the initial mass was 185 milligrams. So it comes down to multiply 185 milligrams of technetium 99M by one over two to the power of eight. One over two to the power of eight is uh, one over 256. So it comes down to divided 185 by 256, and it's 0 0.723 milligrams. And that's the mass of technetium 99M that remains. So that fraction of one over 256 can also be written as 0 0.391 over 100. And this shows you the percentage of uh, you know, what is left after eight half-lives. And it comes to the same um, um, 0.723 milligrams of technetium 99 metastable that remains. All right. Um, let's do another practice example here. Um, hydrogen 3 undergoes beta decay with a half-life of 12.32 years. How much of a 37 gram sample will remain after 49.28 years? So um, again, you want to practice by trying to solve this on your own before you watch the solution. So pause the video. So determine how many half-lives occur in the given amount of time. So we have 49.28 years. And the half-life is in years. So we can use the fraction uh, of one half-life over 12.32 years. And years cancel. And we can see that uh, 49.28 years divided by 12.32 is exactly four half-lives. So we have four half-lives occurring during those 49.28 years. So four half-lives of um, hydrogen three. And so for each of these half-lives, we multiply the initial mass, so 37 grams by one half. Um, you know, so it's going to be 37 grams times one and a half to the power of four because we have four half-lives. Uh, two to the power of four is 16. So it's like multiplying by one over 16. 37 divided by uh, 16 is 2.3125. And if we take into account the number of sig figs in the given amount of um, sample in grams, uh, it's two sig figs. So 2.3 grams of uh, hydrogen three remains. This can also be written as uh, 6.25 over 100. This is the percentage uh, that corresponds to 1 over 16. And uh, that's the percentage uh, of 37 grams that will remain, so 2.3 grams of hydrogen 3. All right. So. Uh, section four uh, goes over detecting and measuring radioactivity, uh, but we will um, go briefly over this um, and focus on actually the uh, section B, the effect of radioactivity. And so um, radioactivity cannot be seen, smelled, tasted, heard, or felt, and yet it can have powerful effects very powerful effects because it is high in energy. Uh, nuclear radiation uh, penetrates the surface of an object or living organism where it can damage or kill uh, cells. So the cells that are most sensitive to radiation are those that undergo rapid cell division, such as those in bone marrow, uh, skin, uh, reproductive organs, the intestinal tract, and so all of these systems will be affected by nuclear radiation the most. On top of that, uh, because cancer cells divide rapidly uh, as well, um, they are also particularly sensitive to radiation. And this can make radiation an effective method of cancer treatment. 
Um, radiation is also used in the food industry. Uh, it is irradiated uh, using uh, gamma rays, uh, and it kills any living organism in the food. And so, um, to in decrease the incidence of harmful bacteria in food, uh, these are, are irradiated like strawberries, uh, tomatoes. It's used a lot for fruits and vegetables. But the food do not come into contact with the radioisotopes, right? The gamma ray is only a high energy ray. And so the food is not um, radioactive afterwards. It's not radioactive, but it helps to have a, a considerably longer shelf life. Uh, the gamma rays merely penetrate the food and destroy any living organism. And so as a result, the food has a considerably longer shelf life. We've seen that um, evolution in the supermarkets. Um, and so um, section five focuses on health and medicine. And so um, radioactive isotopes are used for both uh, diagnostic and therapeutic procedures in medicine. Um, in a diagnostic test uh, to measure the function of an organ or to locate a tumor, low doses of radioactivity are generally given. But when the purpose is uh, using radiation of, uh, as a therapy, therapy, therapy sorry, such as killing a cell, um, disease cells or cancerous tissues, then a much larger dose of radiation is um, required. And so radioisotopes can be injected or ingested. So there are different ways of giving the radiation, uh, the radioisotopes to a person. If an organ is malfunctioning uh, properly, um, if an organ is functioning properly or to detect the presence of a tumor. So again, that's um, image imaging here. So using a scan, normal organs are clearly visible while malfunctioning or obstructed organs are not. Um, so that's the um, uh, diagnostic way of using radioactivity. But because rapidly dividing cells are more sensitive to radiation damage, it's also used to control some cancers because you know how cancer is the fact that cells are um, dividing very rapidly. And so it can be treated uh, externally by using gamma rays because they are very high energy rays or internally um, gamma rays can be more localized or beta emitters can be implanted. So that would be uh, implantation of a radioactive isotope in the body uh, near the site of the tumor. So um, here it's an example of a radioisotope used in diagnostic. Um, so technetium 99 uh, metastable is uh, injected. And um, it's used to evaluate the gallbladder and bile ducts and to detect internal bleeding. But here, the example uh, of the image shows um, a diagnosis for the, the gallbladder and bile duct. And because uh, you see how it is illuminated by the uh, radiation here, uh, technetium 99 is emitting um, gamma rays. So, it shows how this is a healthy individual, right? Typically, when the radioisotope cannot go into the, the areas that we are trying to visualize, that means there is a problem with the organ. So here, that would be the um, image of a healthy individual because we see the gallbladder and we see how the radioisotope has been able to uh, you know, travel where it's supposed to go, stomach and bile duct. Um, and so radioisotopes are also used in treatment and more specifically uh, all kinds of cancers. Um, so uh, iodine-131, for example, is used in hyperthyroidism. 
or, or to treat uh, thyroid tumors. So here um, you would uh, take um, a molecule that contains iodine and that uh, typically goes around the thyroid and that would deliver the um, um, radiation at the thyroid, so localized. Phosphorus 32 is used to treat uh, leukemia and lymphomas. Iridium 192 is used for the cancers of the breast. Thallium 201 is used to visualize heart function. Uh, xenon 133 is used to look at the lung function. Technetium 99 metastable uh, can uh, be used to visualize bone, bones. Or as we saw uh, in the previous slide, the gold bladder function can be uh, visualized this way. Technetium 99 metastable is also used to visualize gastrointestinal bleeding. Um, this slide is about positron emission tomography. Uh, position emission tomography scans use radioisotopes which emit positron, like the name says, which enables scanning of an organ. So this is for um, imaging, right? Um, and so the positron sometimes um, also gives off um, X, uh, gamma rays. So PET scans can detect tumors, coronary artery disease, Alzheimer disease, and track the progress of cancer. Typically, if you do not see uh, the uh, radioactive element um, in the brain, for example, that tells you there is a decreased activity in the brain, so that can you know, tell you there is Alzheimer disease. Um, so that's, and that can help track the progress of cancer. Um, PET scans is a non-invasive method of monitoring cancer treatment, apart from taking a low doses of radioisotope, because you need to ingest those uh, radioisotopes to visualize. Um, but otherwise, the PET scan, when it's done, is not invasive. So um, this shows uh, uh, different images of positron emission tomography, PT, PET. So on the left, uh, the PET scan shows cancer of the lymph the nodes in the neck and abdomen, as well as scattered areas of tumor in the bone marrow of the arms and spine before treatment. Uh, B, so B is just uh, to help you visualize where things are. So we recognize the kidney in the bladder in the center there. And then on image C, uh, the PET scan shows significant clearing of the disease after chemotherapy uh, has been uh, administered. And so we see a decrease in the intensity of the radioisotope. Uh, the dark regions in the kidneys, in the torso and bladder and the lower pelvis are due to the concentration of the radioisotope before elimination uh, in the urine. So this helps show you know, how effective the treatment has been. All right, so this ends uh, section five of chapter 10.